And then there are the inevitable question marks surrounding the movement Omega chose to power the first Omega in space. Reference 2998 was powered by Caliber 321, one of the rarest and most collectible chronograph movements ever made. Instead, Omega ultimately chose to power the first Omega in space with its most recent evolution, Caliber 1861. This watch was almost impossible to make and everyone thought we were just wasting time talking about it. Well, Luca has this personality and he cannot say no. He never said no to anything. He says, Jacob, if this is what you want, I'll make it work. Has anybody ever placed that this is the same designer as the M1? Anybody on the street saying, oh my God, you're wearing the watch and you're driving the car? <laughs> no, 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 I, I don't think until I made the connection. But I've never actually driven the M1 with that watch, which would be the ultimate in nerdery. You probably have to do that. I think it's, I think, I think it's important. Yeah. <laughs> Most antique pocket watch dealers, when we first started to see wristwatches, we didn't think it was a market that was actually going to succeed. We thought, well, they're not that special to start with. We're only made 50 years ago or 60 years ago. Everything that you see in a wristwatch is already happened in a pocket watch. Obviously it was a mistake on my part. <laughs> the Neomatic collection is consisting of 10 watches. For us it's a big step to introduce the new automatic movement which is completely made in-house in Glashütte. So one of the advantages we have over everybody else in the world probably is like, I just have all the 3D printers. So we can have an idea and by the end of the day, we can have multiple iterations of it. And so the design part of it is really fast for us. And then we got to the point where we're like, okay, here it is. Let's go find a partner to help us make it. And we're fans of it. And then they, they released this sort of surprise album of 20 big pilots or 20 pilots watches and I think probably no less than six new big pilots. Yeah. It's an infusion of that sort of great, strong, historical heritage thing. And this, this shuts us up. It does. <laughs> this shuts us up, you know? It does. And it also gets me back into IWC and yeah. back into the pilot. For this one, just the, the wear on the dial, the patina, just the way that the dots have flaked. Yeah. And just the small rows on there, you know, I, and I believe this one maybe is 79, 28. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it doesn't disappoint wearing it either. You know, the yeah. no date, just a very clean watch. And, you know, I wear this one quite a bit too. You know, you can pair it with a NATO strap or, you know, right now I have just a rubber strap on there. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I really enjoy wearing it. So what Giles and I will do is say, here's the next stage we want to get to. And it might be to invest in a certain bit of machinery. That's going to cost X, but to get there, we have to have X amount of cash flow coming in from watch sales. And so it's just being sensible. We don't have any goal to sell 500,000 watches or 300,000 or 100,000. There's no sort of goal like that. It's about sustaining yourself commercially and being sensible about it. For us, it's important to be as good in, in the design of the new overseas collection as we have been in the design and development of the unique piece 57 to 60. Be as good in the segment of sport casual watches where overseas is located. We have an incredibly strong community. The discussion forums and social media and Instagram and Facebook groups, that is one of the huge pleasures of this hobby. And I can't imagine just having the watches without this community. Maybe that's the way it was done before the internet, but you know, that's what makes this, to me, such a great hobby. We have about a 400 square foot Cartier salon in the store. IWC and Panerai were great additions to the store. Bacheron Constantine and Jaeger Colt are great partners as well. Baum and Mercier, which we've been partners with for decades, and A. Long and Son, just a wonderful addition to the store. So we're very happy to have them here as well. I must know at least 25 British watchmaking businesses of one shape or another. I can't think of any of them where I'd look at it and say, they're fleecing the public. They're laughing at their customers. How dare they charge what they do for what they create. The ones I see all look to have very carefully considered where they wanted to put themselves in the market and price themselves accordingly. 
and so far, touch wood, I think it's a fairly open and fair market. Our clients are enamored with these mechanical wonders and the only thing that I think would impede this love affair would be with poor after-sales service. And I look at this as a great opportunity to acquire a client and deliver the promise that they were given when we sold them a watch. It is one that I think is going to be considered by modern watchmaking connoisseurs as kind of a cult classic or something of a modern classic because it just offers so much bang for the buck and so much technical innovation in a case that is so incredibly wearable. What you see here, there's no dial on the 1991. You see the, the bridge is part of the movement. He forecasted to make 12 of these pieces, but at that time, every part was made by hand. So he completed the third one, he said, no more, just, just too boring for him to do the same thing over and over again. <laughs> I'm wearing this watch in a show, huh. right? This little Octavia in Sifford colors. And I knew the second this episode aired, I would be on the dash. That's really funny. And I was and were, in yeah. on the dash. Yeah. <laughs> and that, I don't know, I have a TV show, but being on, on the dash was more exciting than that. That is so funny. Being on your website is more exciting to that. You know, these are the things that I get excited about. I'm fans of what you do and what you, and your site does. So it is really exciting to be here doing this with you. When you look at the gallery, you see one, two, three big machines, watch, and it's not in any shape or form a process of perfection and then miniaturization. This is a completely different technology. I think there have been more than one occasion in the last 20 plus years that both Livia, my wife and partner and I have said the one thing we want to sell one day at auction is a stainless steel 1518. Well, here it is. They're very easy to access, even easier to operate. You just need to push on the corrector once to move the disc by one increment. This not only makes this calendar one of the friendliest to use, it also makes it one of the cleanest because you don't have the adjustment dimples that you would usually find on the side of the case. So I put in a fixed bid onto it and I lost. I got an email from Charles, I think about three, four weeks later, saying the gentleman who'd bought it, and he didn't mention who it was, having sort of found on the internet that I was looking for it for so long, wanted to offer it to me at the same price that he paid for it. And I thought that was quite cool and amazing and stuff. And I subsequently found out it was uh, Jason Singer. Um, <laughs> and I've met him a couple of times now. Once was at JFK in transit, but I thought that was just, he's just an amazing guy. I mean, to do that, it, it just shows you that there's some amazing people out there. What I design is what I make. And I think that's very important. More so on the Isle of Man. Obviously, there's no other watchmaking on the Isle of Man. The influences just aren't around. And I can just get on with my day's work and just make what I want to make. And I can design a component, and by the end of the day, we can have that component fitted into a watch. And that, to me, is true independence.